I, I always like to say, if you see somebody really desperate in need, stop and say hi at least. Yeah. If you can. As my mom I am a hamburger. Me. My mom taught me years ago, when you're having a bad day, go help somebody else. Yes. Okay, that, because you're important. gonna feel better, but by helping somebody else, you're doing good. You're creating a positive impact on the world. And you don't know how that's gonna ripple. Yeah. It could be you know, the butterfly effect in a positive manner, but by changing your focus to gratitude or service to others, you're gonna be better off. As Muhammad Ali said, service to others is the rent that we pay for our room here on earth so if you can turn around and help somebody else out in some capacity like we used to tell the cub scouts do a good turn daily if you go and do that it's going to have impact that you'll never know about because this person can help that person who does something here that you know then turns around saves this kid's life and he grows up to cure cancer who knows but you do it not because you can see the chain but because you have faith in humanity To overcome, you must educate. Educate not only yourself, but educate anyone seeking to learn. We are all dead America. We can all learn something. To learn, we must challenge what we already understand. The way we do that is through conversation. Sometimes, we have conversations with others. However, some of the best conversations happen with ourselves. Reach out and challenge yourself. Let's dive in and learn something right now. Today we're speaking with Joe Templin. Joe Templin is a human Kaizen expert an author, a polymath, and an autodidact. He is the author of Everyday Excellence. Joe, could you please introduce yourself, let people know just a little bit about you, please. Brad, I think you did a great job introducing me. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, another way to introduce me would be that to say I'm a human Swiss Army knife because I've got, as you talked about, a rather eclectic background. Uh, I started college when I was 13 because my parents said 12 was too young. Uh, I was an applied physicist. I built uh, <laughs> stuff for the government. Uh, I uh, started Taekwondo at uh, like 12 years old. This is after I was dead from my asthma, by the way. I, I got better, obviously. Uh, ended up winning a couple of world championships and all that. Uh, I built a career doing financial planning. Because of the Taekwondo and the other competitive things that I was doing, um, I started studying psychology, performance psychology, behavioral economics, eventually built my own consulting firm. And that led me into the writing of the book, Everyday Excellence, which is really an attempt to help others along in their journey in the ways that I've been helped by multiple others, whether it's books, podcasts various teachers, instructors, people who've come across my life, study. So it's an attempt to give people a tool to help them be better on a regular basis. I call it a multivitamin for life. Awesome. You know, Joe, you're a cornucopia of knowledge. That It's amazing when you start digging into what you've done. Would you say I, I don't look old I, enough? <laughs> you 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 do <laughs> you don't even look old enough for all this joe come on come on I'm just let all the heavy <laughs> jive and money wow I, I love it yeah and and kicking it 18 again huh you know it's we're right. always a child at heart if we remember that and the world it puts on so much burden to us we panic sometimes and we forget how to be social accepting of others you know how do we handle all this joe what what's our purpose in life well we want to be childlike as opposed to childish and as einstein said the essence of genius is to maintain the uh mindset of a child always and if we continue to 
believe that we're young and act like we're young, maintain that growth mentality that Dr. Carol Dweck talks about in a lot of early research, we can continue to grow. And, you know, 50 is within 30 in a lot of ways, especially with a lot of the innovations in medical science, nutrition that we're seeing. I mean, we work one out of, out of three babies born this year is probably going to see a hundred. We could probably push that even higher and not just live for a long time, but actually live and have quality of lifestyle based on our individual choices. And it comes down to that in a lot of ways. Um, we were talking about this earlier, but we have become a society of convenience. And convenience kills. It's lowly yeah. can kill your soul because it's so easy. There's 5,000 channels on TV. You can get any food that you want essentially instantly. So calories are no longer as valuable. Um, you know, the cost of light has gone from being several hours of your day, sacrifice work in the fields to get an hour of light at night. So literally you can have years worth of light for an hour worth of work. So we no longer appreciate these things. Stuff is no longer hard. And if things are too easy, they're not appreciated. That is so true. And I, I look at the world today and I see that everywhere. And you, you mentioned we, we have a narcissistic outlook. We, we portray narcissism uh, at our very core anymore. Uh, we have to have that thumbs up, the like. Uh, we care about what other people think of us instead of what we think of ourselves, which is more important. And that's a very, a very old school stoic idea is that we look externally when we should be focused in. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we turn the tide with so much of this around us? And we, we fall into this hopelessness per se, when we, Say, why should I even try if nobody else around me is trying? Well, it comes down to that. You know, why should I try? Because that's what human beings do. We are meant to strive and grow. Look at a, a little kid, okay? No little kid, no baby can walk. They see big people. So what do they do? They try and they fall and they try and they fall and they try and they fall. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Eventually, they pull themselves up, and they're pulling themselves along the couch, and then they lay across the floor, and they've fallen a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand times, but they don't give up. Henry Ford, I mean, not Henry Ford, uh, Edison failed ten thousand times to make the light bulb, and everybody's like, "Woo!" We, you know, we finally did it, and he was had such stick to it of a mess. Babies, every kid does that, but as we become big people, we forget about this capability of failure as feedback and a way to learn and improve. And so there's an old saying that the master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. And so we need to go back to embracing failure with a purpose of trying to achieve something. For example, anybody who's played an instrument, you know, when you start playing violin at seven years old, you sound like you're strangling a cat. By the time you're 11, you can do your scales and you can play fairly decently. By the time you're 14, 15, it actually sounds reasonable. And if you keep at it and you invest the time, you sacrifice the time, essentially, because you could be sitting there playing video games like everybody else. But if you sacrifice the time to achieve greatness, by the time you're 18, 19, 20 years old, you sound really darn good. And even if you don't continue to play at the level and continue to practice, or to make it like your profession long range, you can still be a really good amateur. You can entertain yourself, you can entertain others because you did that. Same thing with martial arts, same thing with uh, picking up a language, all these other things. So people have it so easy. Everybody wants to Google Translate or you know, they're just gonna you know, type it in and get the response instead of actually learning how to do something and invest a little time so that it pays dividends in certain ways. Yeah, and that's so important, that time value put in. But, you know, Edison is the best example I can think of with the light bulb. Uh, I love that analogy, and it it develops us 
you know, baby steps us into something. And when we start something new and we think we like it, we don't really know that we like it because there's always work involved in anything we do. And when we hit that rock wall of work, that's when people say, oh, well, I don't like this anymore. You've got to push through that. Right, and because beyond in. that rock wall of liking something is where you love it. So That's right. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you to, yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger was asked about his discipline. He's like, I have no discipline. I loved what I was doing. Every rep made me better, brought me closer to my goal. So I would, you know, lift until I passed out, wake up and keep going because it was what I needed to do. It was so important to me. And uh, we see this in the academic world in a lot of ways where people are like working on their PhD dissertation and they're just so psyched about the research that they forget to eat for a couple of days. Or, you know, when like uh, I've got teenage boys, they get there and they're playing video games and like five hours later, the time is fast. If you can find that level of engagement for other things, something that actually contributes to the world, then that's how you can truly achieve excellence and find something that motivates you. And having something that you care about that much, that eliminates the deadness inside. You know, uh, Mark Manson, the author of the Star Wars, not given an F, I swear, by the way. Okay. Sure. Right. So I was not giving a fuck. You know, all these Karens who are complaining about stuff, it's because they've got nothing to really care about. And so they've got these first world problems and they're being old biddies and getting involved in stuff. You know, I don't care about that because I'm busy with my mission of trying to reach 100 million people and help them be better. That drives me. That gets me up at 4 15 in the morning. You know, and I'm still working at 10 o'clock at night. And it doesn't matter how tired I am. That is so important. The mission is what drives you. As Nietzsche said, if a man has a strong enough why, he can overcome any how. If you carry that much and it's that critical to you to do this, if it's like as important as breathing, guess what? You're going to find a way or make a way, as Hannibal says. So you're just going to keep going. And if that is how we eliminate the emptiness inside is by filling it with something worthwhile. Yeah, that's right. You know, my guest yesterday that I was interviewing, we were speaking about being in that zone. When 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 we're doing something, it's always art. And w you just explained it. When when you're doing something and you are finding pleasure in that zone, you are lost into it until your system tells you you're done. I and and that is how America was built. And it's not necessarily easy. I mean, as a martial artist, there are times when it right. sucks with my training, where if I'm like <laughs> um, doing training for an ultra marathon and run in the rain or whatever, it's horrible. But it's the sort of thing where you're like, I will do this because of what's on the other side. It is, you know, um, running in the rain is the best example of squishy feet, which I hate and all that. And I do it because even though I hate it, I know it's going to help me in other capacities. And being willing to go and do that thing that you really dislike, knowing that it's critical for the success. So, for example, um, let's say that you're a young business person and you hate doing the marketing. But you know if you don't do the marketing component where it's picking up the phone in the old school way or putting together stuff on the computer and doing digital marketing, if you don't do that, you have no customers. You can't serve other people. Well, you're going to do that thing that you hate because you get to do the stuff that you love. It's like eating the liver so you can have the dessert. I hate liver. My family loves liver. My mom loved it, you know, great stuff. But you know what? I ate the liver so I could have the stuff that was on the other side. I, you know, do the yard work for five hours and that beer that I get afterwards that I earned is the best beer in the world. So all too often people are like just getting the reward without having to do the work. They're not going yeah. through the pain, the suffering, as I said. It's too convenient. It's too easy. They can just Google something. You know, they can just throw something in the microwave instead of having to do it by hand and cook it longer. Rate. You know, it, I guarantee you that most people, if they could essentially microwave the baby and have it in two months instead of nine, they would do that. But anything great, anything worthwhile takes a while. And we don't have the patience. Uh, 
Joe, I want to talk a little bit about influence and, you know, influence comes from every place. Television is the old boob tube. Everybody, <laughs> you know, I, I sat down there. That's babysitter for a while. And that's absentness of parents. And there's a lot of this going on now with our cell phones and things like that. So it, the babysitter is shifted, but yet it's still the same thing that we've been dealing with for years and years. There's a disconnect there between what should be connected. Well, Can it's you talk about a very that? passive way of doing things. So I don't care if it's the kid playing on the iPad or watching people play video games on YouTube or the boob tune from, you know, the 1970s and 80s. You know, there's not an interaction. They're not changing their environment. When I was a kid during the summers, my mom would kick me outside and say, um, you know, there's a, the garden hose, you know where the bathroom is. I don't want to see you till lunchtime. Have fun, don't die. And... That's what we did. So we were out running through the fields and you know, doing stuff. And this was a very 70s way to grow on up. And so we were responsible for ourselves. And so, you know, yeah, we have some scars from it, but we also learned responsibility. We learned the connection between action and result. There was consequences for our actions, our decisions. And we also learned personal responsibility around it. And that's something that's not being allowed very much anymore. And I think part of it is because we've got more and more people, so the bell curve is getting bigger. And when you have more of a population, 350 million versus 100 million, you know, you've got to have more people on the extremes. When you have more people on the extremes, that means that you have more people doing stupid stuff. And those people doing stupid things, what they're trying to do is that they are putting in protections to take care of that bottom 0.1%. And what it's done is it's now made it so everybody else can't do the things that they did because of that. For example, what was the last time you saw a merry-go-round at a playground? <laughs> yeah, you, you don't see them. Okay, because we you know one or two kids across the entire country, you know, got super hurt when the rest of us just got mildly hurt and learned, hey, that's what your yeah. force is. And hey, I shouldn't do that. It had to hurt me and things like that. And so they have put these bubble wrapping and these walls up. And it's like when they put a uh, railing at the edge of the cliff, everybody gets the false sense that, oh, it's now safe. And so everybody goes to the edge of the cliff and eventually they all fall off because of the illusion of safety and the disconnect. Because it used to be you did something stupid, you got hurt right away, and you realized don't do it again. And that would happen with little things. And so you learn to interpolate from there to bigger and bigger things. And that's why common sense was fairly common. You know, now they don't do that. It's all protected. It's all isolated. It's all TV where it's passive as opposed to playing with stuff like, ow, that's hot or that's cold. Or, so you're not getting that. And it was that sort of interaction that allowed people to have a more intuitive understanding, but also to be have interpolative powers and say, oh, yeah, that's, I'm not going to go there. I mean, I remember when I was in my fraternity, um, this is going back 30 years ago, we had a really bad idea. And so what did we do? We took out a napkin and we started doing some calculations on the back of it to see if something would kill someone. And we're like, oh, this won't kill anybody. Right? And it's not even close in terms of the calculation. So let's just do it. And we ended up building a 55 foot funnel uh, and crazy stuff like that. <laughs> but, you know, now they would just do something without checking it because we did a couple of other things that we did some calculations on. We're like, yeah, that's not a good idea. We're going to die. <laughs> but, you know, because we had made little mistakes along the way, we were able to do things like this and figure it out and start developing some sense of the return on it in terms of uh, what was done. So I don't know how many people here in the Northeast, there are pipes freeze in the winter because they don't realize, hmm, you know what? We need to, when it gets cold, things expand and things freeze. That's like, yeah. why don't you know this basic premise 
that most kids find out when they're like six years old from leaving a bottle of wine yeah. outside or something. You know, yeah, what, that's what's different that. It's because it's become uncommon because of this disconnect, because of this passive learning environment or passive yeah. babysitting environment that we were talking about, as opposed to playing in the dirt and, you know, getting some, you know, bug bites and scars, but minor things as opposed to major damage later on. Because, yeah. you know, going back to my book, you know, that cool non-layer growth curve, this happens both for good and for bad. If you don't address the problem, it becomes horrible over time. Whether it's uh, compound interest on credit cards, or it's not having the discussion with your significant other, and things get worse and worse, and eventually somebody's having an affair, or you know uh, other problems like this. But it can also happen on the good side, where you're investing things properly, like you set aside money on a regular basis. You have money for a kid's education or retirement. You set aside time on a regular basis, whether it's for your physical health or for learning. And eventually, you get advanced degrees, or you're in good physical shape. This sort of compounding, this nonlinear growth curve is both a positive and a negative. And we've seen a lot of the negative effects because people avoiding and pushing off, kicking the can essentially of the responsibility, it's coming back and, you know, as Jordan Pearson says, the dragon is now huge. Yeah, that's right. And, and dragons can burn. That's for sure. So, you know, there's, there's this bad environment in the world today and eventually it's going to get better uh, uh, it's always that way there's a roller coaster yes so, a pendulum swings back and forth exactly it's the pendulum effect we we are on i hope one of the far reaches of this panel pendulum now because uh we really need to start addressing the change that needs to occur in our world. It's going to get a little bit worse for a little while because people don't have enough suck it up. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it, 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 there's all. still some excess in the system in a lot of ways that needs to be pushed on through. And people need to take a little more personal responsibility, roll up their sleeves a little bit more, you know, skip a few meals, have some sleepless nights. You know, have to actually have real problems and figure That's out right. how to solve them. And, you know, another six months to 18 months of that, you're going to see a big change in people. And, you know, you're going to see, I think, actually, the younger generation. So the younger Gen Z, people from like 16 down to um, maybe six or so, they are going to be much more like, the people who grew up during World War II. So yeah. not the greatest generation, the silent generation after them, which is what my dad's generation was. These are people who saw the sacrifices, felt the tough times, you know, maybe lived through the or lived depression a little bit. And so not necessarily became frugal, but understood the value. Not everything's cheap and disposable and throw it away and we just replace it. Not, you know, you throw away people the same yeah. way that you do, uh, you know, a single serving cop, you know, which is basically what Tinder and all these other things really are. So that there's more value, that there's more time, that they understand, you know what, things are going to take a while. And if need be, I can make sacrifices to get what I need down the road. So I think that we're going to see probably... My my kids, my youngest one's 11 and a half. So his peers, 10, 15 years from now, we're going to, if we survive that long, have a really good, probably 15, 20 years from that, that point when they're really starting to get going in the marketplace because there will be a seismic shift because of that attitude returning to the more fundamental patient matter that we've seen previous yeah the world's changing that's for sure and and i'm i'm really excited and i'm pretty optimistic about it because i believe that that hardship that you talked about it's going to kick us in the gear and uh that's that's really what i'm anticipating i hope it doesn't take 30 years 50 years but 
you know, change comes slowly. Well, one point my father remember is that some of the greatest, biggest corporations and greatest fortunes are always made during choppy times. I mean, in the 1970s, that's when we saw Microsoft and Apple bound. Okay. Yeah. If you go back into you know, the depressions or the recession of the 1950s, that's when Hewlett Packard was made. So there is always going to be opportunity for those who uh, are willing to work hard, have vision, approach things differently, are willing to sacrifice and play the long game. There will always be opportunities. I don't care how big the market is or how bad the market is. The, that potential will always be there for some people. Yeah. The question is, is the majority of society of the right mindset to make that opportunity extend to a ton of people? Or is it only going to be limited to the people with the greatest amount of discipline and desire? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. You know, that that want to do something for yourself and not have somebody do it for you. That's unique in the world anymore. My my father, he's a World War II vet. Well, was. He's passed now. But, you know, his mindset was totally different from adults today. And I, my father would actually slap people, to be frank about it, in today's world. And I, I kind of look back and see how uh, goofy the world had become because of all of that prosperity that flooded us after the World War II. Right. And, you know, when, when I got married in the 80s, I really, I really stopped and thought, is this a good move to be married? Is, is my future really going to be worth anything because of all of the ups and downs during the latter part of the 70s, early part of the 80s? And then uh, Reagan and Gorbachev, it really changed everything when that Berlin Wall fell. It changed the world, just the attitude shift. And I, I really thought we would go in a different direction at that point in time. But I think we just drugged the world down with us into this cesspool of uh, easy, disposable living like you were talking about earlier. So how, how can we add how can... talks about desired difficulty? And so this is something that it is tough, really, when you're successful to try and make things difficult for your kids. I had this conversation with one of my close friends. She's a senior vice president for a tech company, you know, makes a lot, a lot of money. And yeah, the response from her, and she grew up with nothing, dirt, it, it, because she's so successful is to throw money at her. And um, it is one of those things where it's like, no, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and try and fix these things and show the boys this is the way that is. So my kids know that my first response is always going to be no, always, because it's always, if you say yes, then saying no is a sacrifice. But if you say no, then, you know, you can loosen it up over time. And so there was a, a thing a few years ago where, uh, I had clogged drains and everything. And so I tried snaking it and everything. And the boys saw me attempting these things. Still, they didn't work really well. You know, went down and uh, the pipes were completely clogged. 130-year-old home. So it happens over time. Uh, and I was going to cut the pipes and drain them and do everything on my own. And after an hour and a half of, of them seeing that I was struggling and I was doing this and everything, I'm like, all right, now's the time to actually call somebody. It was like $250 and they were in and out and a day, in a half day yeah. and right tools versus me sacrificing an entire day. But the boys saw that I worked at it, tried it and made the decision to then call somebody else. But like we had to have a guard, okay? They see me 
till the garden. We plant the garden together. We weed it. We do all the things. Even though it's not a big thing and it doesn't grow a ton of food, they have more of an appreciation because of doing this. I grew up on the farm where if you didn't work, you didn't eat. So I value where food comes from because we had to work for it. We had to go and take care right. of the animals in the morning and all that. My kids aren't going to get that full experience, but they've gotten enough to have a better appreciation of it than people who just go and swipe mom or dad's credit card and food instantly appears. That's right. Yeah, you know, I was out planting peas this morning in my garden for our fall harvest. And that that work ethic to get it done, it, you've got to put it in yourself yeah. uh, because nobody's going to do it for you. So you need to be exposed to it. We need to expose our kids. And so I think like yeah. and kids need to work on a farm yes. a couple of times throughout their life because they learn to understand. FFA. <laughs> I, I love FFA. I was part of it, you know, and just what you learn that your food does not just show up on the supermarket shelf. It's right. it's a it's a vital lesson. And uh, we we all pack ourselves into cities and that's not really healthy in my mindset. But well, if you look, I mean, the United States was founded. Something like 99% of our population was agrarian. Mm -hmm. And if you look today, that's right, about 1% agrarian. And so we've had this massive shift, and every single decade is moved more and more away from being landed of people working and directly creating what they eat, what they use, you know, that's right. having this connection to their effort and what they get to enjoy from it. And so having more of that, an appreciation of that, even if it's, you know, a kid just goes and works on a farm for a week or, you know, goes and actually works in a, a shop for a while so that there is more of a connection as opposed to everything being on a computer screen and, you know, up here and looking at things, it's going to create more value and appreciation. Also, um, you know, when people were pushing everybody, oh, you gotta go to college, you gotta go to college. And so we have you know, probably 30, 40 million people with useless college degrees out there. And they look down their nose at people who are in the trades. Yeah. I've got a good friend who dropped out of college where he was studying engineering, uh, as parents, his dad was an engineer, his twin brother's an engineer, actually, to go, uh, learn how to weld. He joined a company, he's a welder, and he's a senior welder, and he makes six figures a year now, but he'll always have a demand for what he does. He enjoys it. There's a connection, and he's still utilizing his mind in a lot of ways because he's doing all his calculations and understanding and everything, but having skilled tradesmen is critical. And so I think that everybody should find something that they do with their hands to help offset the work of the mind and vice versa. So my friends who are work like on the farm or run a machine shop or work in a machine shop or mechanics or things like that, they actually have intellectual pursuits for their rest and leisure. Those of us who utilize our mind, which is way too many people or should be using the mind, you know, not betting actually think, should be finding something physically intensive to offset that and to appreciate it. And having people have both of these is actually going to reduce a lot of the uh, politicization that we're seeing and the polarization yeah. because yeah. people who have never had to dig ditches don't understand it. And people who've never worn a tie don't appreciate that part either. And so we need to have a coming together uh, and understanding of what others do more, which will create more empathy and resolve a lot of our political issues. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. You know, when Herbert Hoover was kind of kicked out of office and we went the New Deal direction, I, I really wonder about that. What What the world would actually be today if we would have sided with Hoover 
and rolled up our sleeves and got to work and not worried about the government supplying everything you needed. You know, yes, there are loss of life and there's hurt and there's all of this misery, but out of that comes greatness. It yeah, and here's always... the thing. We can't control the weather. We can't control, you know, many things. And people thinking that the government's going to come on in and take care of them and save them has never, you know, really understood how the economy works. And most people in the government actually don't understand it either. And there is an old uh, saying from my friends in the military and in the intelligence community that nobody who has actually worked for the government trusts the government to take care of them. Yeah. Well, that's wise. You know, yeah. uh, my my cousin taught me the seven Ps. Uh, I guess it was 35 years ago. And it's proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Uh, that planning phase, anything we do, if you don't have a plan and a redundancy plan, yep. you know, a backup You need plan. to have resiliency because as Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. But that's right. Just the first thinking about it and looking at some contingencies. So that is, yeah. I don't care if you're in business, I don't care if you're a parent. This is actually something I learned as a special needs parent is having plans, but having the backup plans because yeah. nothing's going to go the way that you think. So as Star Lord says uh, in the Marvel Comics world, you know, I've got 12% of a plan. That's actually better than the vast majority of people. That's and true. You know, in my training, there was always a saying, poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine. And that's unfortunately, gross. we have seen that where people completely fail to plan in any way, shape, or form, and fail to sacrifice, fail to set aside in times of good or times of bad, and expect other people to take care of them when stuff happens. That's right. You know, it, it's your responsibility because it's your life. Uh, I, I was talking about the Stanley Milgram experiment uh, done in the 60s, early 70s, somewhere around there. But what people will do if an authoritative figure in a white coat tells you, you must do this, the experiment depends on you doing this. Who's going to take responsibility? And as soon as the white coat says, I'll take responsibility, you do it. All, all bets are off. Yo, know, the same thing that happened in Nazi Germany is somebody's right to step forward and assume responsibility could then turn around and command the other 85% of the people and they would fall in line. And so, That's right. you know, Americans they, who say, oh, well, you know, in Nazi Germany, I would resist it. Well, you know what? Today's your time to resist, to do the right thing, because... That's right. You know what's the right thing overall. That's right. You know, and, and I, I really encourage people to put your pettiness aside and just calm your mind and think about what is actually happening on, around you. And make a plan for it. Uh, it's so important. Joe, uh, one thing people should be doing also is, you know, they hear this or they see that or that. Just ask yourself, who benefits from it? Yeah, that's a good question. That That's an important question. Well, you know, well, so, you know, there's, you know, this executive order. Who benefits from it? And just you know, yeah. follow the dollars, follow the power, because you know control is as important as money. You know, just think it through it's three or four steps. Yeah, I don't care if it's on the local school board or the police department or ever at the state level or the federal level. Just ask yourself, okay, who benefits from that? And think about it for a couple of months, especially in today's lot. world. Yeah, you know, and and another thing to add to that is not only the benefit of it, but who's going to control it? You well, know, typically that's whose benefit. 
or somebody close to their wider. That's right. So how do we uh, get through it without a civil war at this point, Joe? Because a lot of people are talking about civil war and violence and, you know, I want to put my head in the sand because of the two sides. That's part of the problem is putting the head in the sand, <laughs> becoming an ostrich. And that's right. letting the extremes on either side of the aisle, you know, politicize and dictate and polarize. And what needs to be yeah. done is that we need to remember that more brings us together and pulls us apart, that you should spend time talking with somebody you disagree with, and both of you should have an open mind so that you can understand why they're from that and come to some sort of hopefully middle ground. Because as Sir St. Francis C.C. said, the unexamined life's not worth eliminate. We should also examine our beliefs and beliefs of others. And right. we need to focus on having our personal responsibility. What can I do to make sure myself and my family are taken care of? What can I do to make better decisions to take care of me so that I have better outcomes down the road? For example, all these people who are like, healthcare is you know a right and we need to pay for it all. It's like, okay, with every right, there's an equal and counterbalancing responsibility. If you want me to pay for your health care, you need to be willing to take care of yourself. You need to not eat five cheeseburgers and two donuts every day. Yeah. Exactly. You need to be willing to invest 30 to 45 minutes of physical activity every single day. If you're willing to make that trade off, I'm willing to pay taxes to cover that stuff. But if you're not, don't think that you can have all of the fun with none of the cost. Don't think that your actions are completely um, disconnected from their consequences. We need to remember that and take a responsibility for our own actions and consequences. So if we had more people doing it and had a little bit more of a suck it up mentality, we could have some uh, better outcomes. And because of what's going on economically now and the, the uh, essentially pushback from what's been occurring with the extremism on all the sides and now we've got inflation or these other things, we're going to see more people saying, what can I do to make things better for me and my family? I think that's going to be one early stages of us turning it. Yeah. Uh, I want to address one more issue with you that we're really facing, and it's really bad in our world today, Joe. And I I found myself guilty of it yesterday, and I was put in check. Thank the person for putting me in check, because I like to be checked. Mm -hmm. New sources. Uh, I didn't check a news source, and I shared it out. I, I got lazy for that one time. That one time bit me in the rear. It was a false story. Now, I, I know time gets really sensitive, and I go through things, and sometimes, not very often, because of who is sharing it, I'll just share the story out. Because I'm brought in and but uh, you're doing the right thing. You verify your stuff the vast majority of the time and you trust a source that in the past has been trustworthy. So part of the problem is that there are not nearly as many trustworthy sources. I saw a statistic the other day that um trust in the media is down to like ten percent, which is yeah you know, lower than it is for uh used car sales at this point. Think about that. Wow. <laughs> okay. Because the Ford's estate is no longer completely separate from government in any of the uh, developed worlds. Yeah. They've been in bed for too long as opposed to being, you know, counterbalances. And so um, that is a major concern. And one of the things that would help out is going on a news diet in Huawei. You know, look, doesn't matter. Almost none of it matters. It is all designed to get eyeballs, get attention, create fear, which then allows for further control and division, and ultimately to generate economic return for individuals. 
Yeah. Why do you? So no news is better news. Yeah. So <laughs> the only thing that I care about in the news is the Major League Baseball trade deadline is coming up. I care about that because <laughs> I care about the New York Yankees. But yeah. I don't watch t- very much TV. I mean, I can't tell you the last TV program that I watched. You know, I just quick glance over the headlines. If there's actually anything going on in terms of econo- real economic stuff, not talk, but actual economic policy, I will double check it and research on it. But you know, having an information diet, for the most part, makes sense. I mean, uh, I can't tell you what the current cool TV show is or any of that sort of stuff now because it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's yeah, and I've, meant to distract us. I've actually put myself on a Facebook diet where I, I just go on for the basic necessities. I share the show information and I try to catch up on a few basic friends that I know connect with me. And other than that, I try to stay off and stay busy doing other things because well, I find social media is designed to play to our addictive personalities. If you look, yes. it is designed to be addictive. It hits yes. the same parts of the brain that cocaine, dopamine, processed sugar does. And it yeah. is meant to be that way. So you spend more time there, more eyeballs, more power, more money. So breaking that and minimizing it is critical, but people don't want to because it allows them to not have to think. It fills that void that they have inside to go look at cute cat memes or talk about, you know, so-and-so on TV, you know, and you're the Kardashians or whoever the hell, you know, <laughs> and that allows them to not have to do the deep work on themselves. Yeah, that's right. That's the, and that's where I need to get to do the hard right path of self-improvement and that internal mastery, as opposed to external gravitation we were talking about at the beginning. So tell us about your book, Joe. Why, why did you write it? And what was the process of writing that book? So the book, as I said, is meant to be a multivitamin for life because we all have these different components of our life, our personal health, our uh, physical health, mental health, spiritual health, occupation, communication, our relationships, all this. And because life is complex and stuff's going on constantly, we don't invest the time that we should. We lose track. You know, we're missing different components of it. So the book being a multivitamin for life, it should be taken every single day. Um, I recommend people read it in the morning. Take two to three minutes every day. There's a quote by somebody, whether it's William Shatner, whether it's Muhammad Ali, Oprah Winfrey, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, Dr. Seuss, William Shakespeare. So there's a quote, there's discussion around it, which hits a lot of these different areas. And then there's an action item, because a lot of the other daily readers will talk about something, they'll give you your daily devotional, but they don't then give you a mechanism to reinforce the lesson, to make change in yourself and thus the world around you. So for example, one of my favorite action items that I wrote is to smile at five people. Now, this sounds like a very easy thing. It is because as James Clear talks about in Atomic Habits, having tiny changes produces major results long range, whereas Zeno of Cytium, under Stoicism said, well-being is no small thing, but it's made up of small steps. If you smile, you decrease the cortisol in your system. So you slow down the aging process. Also helps uh, the stop producing belly fat. So there's a physical <laughs> attractiveness reason behind it. But it's a little thing like that. But you also become more creative, more intelligent for 10, 15 minutes. You become more charismatic. So if, because we are social creatures, by smile at you, Ed, real smile like that, from our laughter and all that, you're going to laugh, you're going to smile. And so I have now given you the gift of health for a couple of minutes. You are better off for the next 15, 20 minutes because of what I just did. And maybe you go and you now smile at somebody else or you've got a slightly better mood and so you're more productive or you don't kick the cat or you help a little old lady across the street or what have you. So by something as little as smiling a few more times throughout the day and smiling at others, 
produces these much bigger, these disproportionate positive effects out there. And if we can do things like that on a regular basis, where it's doing a good deed for somebody, whether it's forgiving somebody who's wronged you, whether it's sitting there and assessing your situation as to how to be a better parent or a better mentor at work or what have you, doing these little things on a regular basis over weeks and months produces monstrous changes in ourselves and those around us. And as I said, my goal is to reach out and impact 100 million people this year, even at a tiny capacity like this. But when you come down that and see how those interact with each other, the net effect could be absolutely positively marked. So it's things like that that were the driver behind the ball. That's right. So, so, you know, very important. You change one person's life, you never know who that person might be and who that person might impact or the amount of people they might impact. I, I always like to say, if you see somebody really desperate in need, stop and say hi at least. Yeah. If you can't, As my mom buy them a hamburger. Me. My mom taught me years ago, when you're having a bad day, go help somebody else. Yes. Okay? Uh, because you're going to feel better, but by helping somebody else, you're doing good. You're creating a positive impact on the world, and you don't know how that's going to work. Yeah. It could be you know, the butterfly effect in a positive manner, but by changing your focus to gratitude or service to others, you're going to be better off. As Muhammad Ali said, Service to others is the rent that we pay for our room here on Earth. So if you can turn around and help somebody else out in some capacity, like we used to tell the Cub Scouts, do a good turn daily. If you go and do that, it's going to have impact that you'll never know about. If this person can help that person who does something here that you know then turns around and saves this kid's life, he grows up to cure cancer. Who knows? But you do it not because you can see the chain, but because you have faith in humanity. That's right. And, you know, I, I often tell the podcasters that I help out and work with, don't focus on the numbers, the listeners, focus on the quality of your message. And that will help you change the world. Yep. You know, you, you just never know who you're, you're going to impact. I love it. So, Joe, our time is running out. Uh, I have so much more I could talk to you about. Do you have a call to action for our listeners today? Yes. So my call to action is I want them to go to the website, everyday-excellence.com. That's everyday-excellence.com. Every single day I put up a new micro blog, a quick hit. I, I call them Espresso of Excellence from Joe, where in one to two minutes, even without buying the book or anything else, they can make themselves better. They get a little insight. They improve their mood. Something like this to turn around and help them. And they can do it on a daily basis. Costs them nothing. Yeah, they can buy the book there if they want, all that. They can listen to this podcast and all the other ones. There's all sorts of other things there. But just make that commitment to take a couple of seconds every morning or throughout the day, whenever they want, to improve themselves, cost them nothing, but could mean absolutely everything. So everyday-excellence. Awesome. Where can people locate you and find your books? So hopefully they can find me at a pub, but uh, probably not today. Uh, <laughs> not, not. But they can buy the books wherever books are sold, Amazon, uh, barnesandnoble.com, the local bookstore, they might have to request it, but... It's in the system so it can be ordered. They can get it from my website too. Uh, so there's lots of different places that they can find it. Um, they can interact with me on Twitter or Facebook. It, that's at EDE with Joe, EDE for Everyday Excellence with Joe. That's me. Or as I said, just go to the website and from there they can find all the various resources to help them have a slightly better decision-making process and better help. Joe, you're a fascinating man with some fascinating answers. I thank you for sharing your story and your time here on the Dead America podcast with us. And thank you. Be excellent and grow today.
Thank you for joining us today. If you found this podcast enlightening, entertaining, educational in any way, please share, like, subscribe, and join us right back here next week for another great episode of Dead America Podcast. I'm Ed Waters, your host. Enjoy your afternoon, wherever you may be.